Well, welcome to our live event. You've probably thought I've dropped off the planet, but no, I was traveling. So a return from the Christmas market in the Germany and Austria area of the world. And of course, as a quilter, I had to bring back something fun. And I really wanted to show it with you because as quilters, we all get this Christmas ornament completely. A um, an, what looks like an antique sewing machine with spools of thread, an iron and scissors hanging in from it. So how appropriate is that? So um, Christmas market may be something that you want to um, possibly go on an adventure, maybe next Christmas. Um, we team up with craft tours and take a group. Hopefully we're taking a group next year to Christmas market. And there's always, you know, that piece of fabric that a quilter wants to bring home. So I'm going to show you this fabric and you'll have to look in the future and see if you see a project pop up with this navy and kind of um, rose gold star print pop up in a project. And um, if you do, you'll have to put in the word Innsbruck. And, and then I'll know that you were actually watching the day that I showed the piece of fabric I brought back from Austria. So we are going to be working on the Santa sock today. I know we're getting a little close to Christmas and that maybe time is going to be an issue. Um, there is kind of a quick way of doing one of these without putting a um, piece block in here. So keep that in mind if you're short on time, but really, really want to make some Santa socks using this technique. Okay. So make sure you go in and download the pattern for the Santa sock. It should be in the comment section. My moderator is always Johnny on the spot. He always gets things put in there right away. So the link is there for you to download the pattern if you haven't already. If you downloaded it earlier, because and sometimes in the ads and things, people will see it. If you have an early edition, you might want to go in and pre, uh, reprint page three because I found it. Oops. There's always a time when as you get prepared for something, you're like, oh, no, I missed a line in there. So if you um, pre-printed the pattern. Um, before yesterday, because we were, I was finding the oopses yesterday, um, reprint just page three. So when you go into print, you can do a custom print and you can put in just the page that you want to reprint and not have to do the entire pattern over again. So page three has got that little addition of a piece of fabric that you need to cut. If not, watch the video and I'll point out where the piece is. It is listed later. It's just not cut, uh, listed in the pre-cutting of those um, in the background fabric. So um, the Santa sock pattern, go out and get that pattern. The other thing I want to uh, tell you about is over at Craftsy, which is one of our kind of our um, crafting groups within our, our um, umbrella. Uh, Craftsy has a deal going on over there. So if you're looking for something as a gift for a crafter or you need to make your list to give to Santa, um, they have a, put together some bundles of some really great things on um, discounts on fabrics, yarns, cookware, irons, uh, things on videos, uh, photogra photography, backpacks, all kinds of different um, projects. And um, you can get a 20% off of a $35 purchase. So 20% off is a really good deal. So the, um, the code over there for that is Craftsy. So our moderator is going to put that in the chat also. So if you didn't get all that, you can always go back through the chat and see that wonderful little discount thing that it, maybe you want to go hop over to Craftsy and send the link to, uh, to Santa. Because we, we love those kind of, of gifts. But maybe you also know, have another crafter, a quilter, a knitter, a crocheter, um, someone who does beadwork, um, someone who does photography. That might be the perfect gift for them. So make sure that you go back at the end of the show and look for that coupon card that you can use maybe for the perfect Christmas gift. Okay, Santa sock. This is a little bit more intense. You know, you dream up of an idea because... I'm kind of given a wide berth and coming up with ideas and projects to present to you. And I thought, oh, a Christmas stocking, that would be fun. It'll be easy. Well, of course, my imagination went into the let's do this and then let's do that. So we've got a lot to cover in a fairly short amount of time. Remember, these videos always live 
on our, our Facebook page. You can find them on YouTube on the National Quilter Circle page. Just look for free videos and you can find um, this video if you need to go back and watch a portion over again. Thinking, hmm, how did she put that together? Because I know there's a specific order. So the Santa sock. The first one I put together is this really um, traditional. I had a piece of this, um, what I might almost call retro fabric now, a uh, little cute reindeer on um, the, pr the red print. And I thought, well, that's really cute, but the block kind of stands out against the red. It's a stark contrast. It's a design choice. You know, I did the bright green cuff, very traditional red and green. But I know there are a lot of people out there who are a little bit more modern who may not want to go the red and green route. So I picked a very um, subtle cream color with rust and kind of a dusty blue um, idea. And then where the background of the block we're putting in here matches the body of the sock, it makes the star float more on the project. And just to note, you'll notice that the star itself is in a little bit different position. It um, floats down a little further on the cream color one because I realized this might be a little high, but I didn't want to remake it because I really enjoyed the process. And then, so this one I sat down a little, that you'll note later on a pattern. You can choose where that star goes, a little higher or a little lower on your um, Santa sock. So we are gonna focus on this one because that's the one I used my um, step outs for, the fabrics. So let's get started on um, the portion that we need to attack first is the star portion of the Santa sock. So in your instructions, it will give you yardage for making that star block. Now, if you are not a star block person and you have another block that you'd like to put in there, this finishes six inches. Any six inch block will fit in here. This finished with seam allowances at six and a half. Remember the difference between finished and, and unfinished. This is a finished six inch block in here. So if you want to substitute out, you're always welcome to do that. All of your supplies um, for fabrics and all the material, all the, the tools you need to um, have are within the pattern itself. Um, trying to think if there's anything that's unusual in there. Um, a walking foot for the quilting portion, or if you'd like to do free motion um, quilting, a hopper foot for that. Um, probably the only unusual thing out of there is that I purchased the pom-pom trim to go around the, the cuff here. I thought that added just a little bit more kind of texture and a little bit of fun and whimsy to the sock. So everything else is pretty much the basic sewing supplies that you need to, to have. Now, what we're going to focus on, we're going to get going on the piecing portion. If at any time I say something that doesn't quite track, I do have a cold. So jump into this chat section and say, did you mean just in case? Um, and also jump in and tell us where you're watching from. We love to see um, where our quilt community is watching from. I know that we tend to go from east to west coast. And even outside of that, we have a lot of Canadian watchers. We have international watchers. And since I got to you know, visit Germany and Austria for Christmas market, let's see if we've got any German or Austrian quilters uh, listening in today, being part of our show. So this is the block I'm going to be creating. Let me hold it up here so you can see it a little bit better. It's actually kind of a block within a block. We've got that little pinwheel. And then we've got the kind of traditional eight point star going on in the outer portion. So in order to create that, let's put our block out here. So we know where we're headed. We are going to create pieces. Now we're gonna be using half square and quarter square triangles. Your instructions are very specific about how those um, are cut apart so that it will tell you to cross, uh, if you have a square that needs to be cut once or twice. Um, for instance, the, let's see, putting together, we're gonna put together this centerpiece and then I'll point out what the difference 
pieces are going to be in the end there. I don't have all these trimmed. I left some to trim live with you. So we'll put this together temporarily here. Now, these this pinwheel, because the pinwheel is kind of standing on point, maybe I should put that on my design board so I can hold it up to you. We have quarter square and half square triangle pieces that make up these. So these pieces, the gold, are quarter square, which means they are cut from a square that is cut diagonally in both directions. And I have an example. So we've got a square that has been cut apart in both directions. This has to do with the straight of grain or the, the um, grain lines in the pieces. And we want the strongest pieces to be on the outside edge of our little unit. So we're taking a square, we're cutting it in cro uh, apart in like an X, corner to corner, so that we have these with a grain line, strong portion on the outside edge. Those will go here. So this goes here. All these bias edges are on the interior of the unit so that any stretch that will occur in there, we're gonna be very, very careful when we're piecing this together. And I even suggest using best press or some kind of spray starch before you cut your square so that when you cut it apart, it has some extra body to it because you're gonna be handling it some and that way you won't get distortion on those bias edges. Now, we also have the same shape here as a cream color. And I don't know if I have any left. I do have some pieces left here. There were four of those cut from a square like this. So we have four of the light ones and they are gonna go here. So we're gonna have a piece like this. We're gonna use one of the golds. And we're gonna be joining those together and the instructions have diagrams that tell you how to join those together. And the last portion, this is a three piece um, unit. So we have those two smaller triangles and we have a larger triangle here. And somebody, sometimes people say, well, just cut more quarter square triangles. But what we want is straight of grain or grain line here. So it's cut from a square that is cut apart diagonally so that we have pieces like this. And this will go here. Okay. So these three pieces need to be joined together properly in order to form units like this. So we're going to be putting these two pieces together and we're going to be stitching here very gently we're using we're on bias edges here and then let's sew that together making sure not to flip them around and sew the wrong edge because it's very easy to do when you're moving from the cutting area to the sewing area but we need to make sure we stitch the correct side the reason being that if you mix up the orientation here, you're going to have a pinwheel that may have an interesting spin going on because these are all very um, directional, um, direction sensitive. They all have to be put together the same way, all four pieces. Okay, my iron's hot. I'm going to press seam allowances on this open to reduce the bulk. I don't do that very often. You don't usually hear me talk about pressing seam allowances open, but I'm going to press them open here. And then I'm going to join these two pieces together. Now they're not an exact match. The idea is that these are oversized so that they can be, the units can be trimmed. So you can see I've got trimmed ones here, no dog ears on those. These need to be trimmed in order to put together. So by putting these right sides together, sometimes you can do a fold if you'd like to see where the centers are. But what I usually use is the um, corner here with the seam line underneath. That needs to that will give me the marker that it's centered, and then I will seam along here. Okay. So we have one of our little pinwheel pieces. A little blade of our pinwheel put together. 
Okay, trim some threads here. I always keep my little snips nearby. We've got this seam together. This is what the back side looks like. We're going to take it over to the iron and press. Clean up our space a little bit here. Now I'm going to press the seam allowances toward that larger triangle because they're, it's like the, the direction of least resistance. Instead of buckling back that seam and going toward the two little triangles that are together, it's easiest always to press where there isn't a seam allowance to buckle. So this is the direction my seam allowances are pressed. Now that I have, the reason why, remember, we need to have these all the same so that as we put them together in orientation for our pinwheel, that they all um, will rotate in the same direction. Excuse me just a second. My travels got, got gave me a little bit of a cold, so we need to... Uh, Make sure we don't embarrass ourselves there. Now, these little units I know are small. They need to be trimmed in the instructions. It will tell you to trim them to two inches. And using a ruler, I've put in a guide so I know I'm going to two inches fin um, to trim. I've got a diagonal on my ruler. Most rulers will have a 45 degree line that you can match up with your seam line, seam line going through there. And the other thing is the center. Where is the center of this block? Don't just trim two sides and say, oh, now it's two inches. We need the center portion of this unit. So a block that finish is, that's going to be trimmed to two inches. The middle would be one. So at a one inch in from each side should be the very center point of the block underneath. Once I have that lined up, then I can trim two sides. When it comes to trimming blocks, always realize you have to go from the center out so that your block is the proper size when, and you haven't lost all of your points. So two sides, we're just trimming a little because we're working with quarter square and half square triangles. The math gets almost impossible to get exact and so much sweeter to trim that down to a two inch little square so that you can then Join these together. Got to get my rotation right. Gold point, point, point. Let's do one more so we have it um, ready to go. We are going to be joining that as a simple four patch in the center. And then creating the last little pieces that trim out our center star. Now you could use more colors. You could use less colors. Um, this is, remember, patterns are just um, suggestions. <laughs> you can take them and do whatever you want with them. Okay, we've got four pieces here now. Now, if I want them to rotate, the point is going, you know, pointing that way, pointing up, pointing over, pointing down. It's going to go in all four directions. Then it's just simple four patch construction. Put the two pieces together. I guess I'm doing this from my perspective, but together, seam here, open them up, and then join the other direction so that you have a four patch in the very center block, um, of your uh, star block created. I did, um, you can see all the pressing. Make sure you take the time to press between as you put things together. It makes your block so much neater and tidier when you're done. Things lie flat. I know it's very tempting to just keep sewing, finger press a little as you go and say, oh, good enough. But if you take the time to move to the iron and press with each step, you will have a lot easier time fitting things together. Seam allowances are opened where there should be so that um, you don't have buckled seams. Um, it'll just go on a little bit smoother. Now that we have that center portion, we need four flying geese. And your instructions will tell you what size is your, your cutting, of, of course, has already been done. You've got rectangles and squares. Yes, this is a very traditional way of making flying geese. I tend to go toward the speed methods. But when you're only doing four of them, it seems like it's just as easy to do with the traditional method. So you take a square of fabric that's going to be part of your star point. 
you're going to draw a diagonal line across the block. You're going to put the square into one corner, and then you're going to stitch on the diagonal line. You're going to trim a quarter inch seam allowance and um, be after you stitch and press. Let's do a real quick stitch here. Get my needle in the right position. This is, whoops, this machine loves to eat fabric. So I need just a little, and you've seen me do it before. Use a little spider of fabric, a little um, extra piece. Let's see, we'll use one of these spare triangles that we're not, I'm not using anymore. My, this machine likes to have the needle lodged in something. So if you have that issue, when you go to stitch onto the edge of a piece of fabric, that um, everything kind of gets nested up, put just a little piece of fabric underneath the needle, and then your machine has no problem, well, most of the time. Today, my, my machine just decided he's just hungry. He wants to eat everything. Okay, Let's see if I can get it to work. Of course, when you're live, it's always like that, right? Okay, put it right next to it as it feeds in. Some of the newer machines don't have issues doing that, but some of the more simple machines, which this one is one of those, just has a little bit of problem jumping onto the fabric. There we go, we got it. So we've got that diagonal seam across corner to corner. Taking it to the iron, I'm going to open that triangle up all the way to the stitching line and press. Now we need to do the other side also, but we have the extra layer of fabric underneath. So if you haven't done flying geese before, if this is something new to you, these underneath layers, you can take a scissors, you can use a rotary cutter also, you can trim away that extra fabric, making sure that you leave that top layer that you want to have is your triangle there. Then do the same process on the other side. The diagrams in the pattern will walk you through this step. And marking again, corner to corner, Make sure that when you put your pieces together, you're going corner to corner, and then always peek back to make sure you're going the right direction because it's really easy to throw the triangle on there, do the stitch and go, that is not what I was looking for. So in a hurry isn't always the best. Make sure that you have your square uh, with the marked line positioned properly. Do that last stitching across. Trim. I always, I went to, almost want to trim my underneath piece before I did the pressing, and then I thought, no, that's not the normal way I do it. I leave my underneath layer there and do my press, get that seam warmed up, press the triangle out. I'm using that underneath layer kind of as a guide. My triangle, as I open it up, needs to expose and cover that piece underneath properly. So if I'm leaving it behind as a guide and then I flip it up, I know I've got nice and squared up. Now I can trim away that extra underneath and I have a flying geese unit. You need to make four of those. So I've got four already made of those. So you've got your center piece. Um, let's, see, let's lay these guys out together. So we can just talk through the construction because I'd like to get to the putting the actual um, stocking together because there's kind of a fun trick that you can do um, to put this together. And it's, it's a fun process. So we've got that centerpiece made. We have a flying geese unit for the top, the bottom, and each side. And you'll have one more somewhere. Here we go. Making sure because yesterday when I was making this guy, I almost put one on the wrong way. 
make sure that the points are going toward or away from the center. It's very easy to twist one. That's not going to give you quite the same effect. So making sure if your intent is to have a star, that all the points are going toward the outer edge as you start to assemble this. The last thing you need, of course, is the squares for the corner. So you have row one, row two, because you have this already assembled, row three, and then join the rows together. And that's exactly what I did here. You can see as I fold this, this is a row, this was a row, and this was a row. That creates that center star unit, or the whole um, center or star for your stocking. Now, once you get that portion created, where are we at here? Do we have any questions? Um, Wisconsin, Indiana, South Carolina, Karen from South Southeast Texas. Love it that you're joining us from all over the United States. Sorry about the cold. It's Aren't you glad you get to watch me from video and I can share ideas and not my germs? That's absolutely fabulous. Okay, so let's take the star and figure out how to make it a portion of the front of our stocking. In your pattern, you have a template that's in pieces for the stocking shape itself. And it is it, it resides well there's a hole how it gets assembled this is your kind of like the cover of your puzzle box so you know how it gets assembled um disregard if you happen to see any one inch squares on there because this this isn't to scale this is just telling you how it all goes together then you have four pieces pages eight through eleven that are the actual templates that you need to to print 100%, hopefully. We're, we're working on, there might be a little bit of a tweak in it, but it's enough that you can, can assemble this without um, too much issue. Um, technology and I kind of were going head to head on getting the template scanned and properly sent off to our graphic designer. So it's not his fault, it's mine, on getting things um, properly scaled. So you should have something that probably looks something like this when you get everything assembled. It may not be perfect. Hopefully we can resolve that. But you know what? At this point, it's a Christmas stocking. Just even out the edges if they don't perfectly match. This, this portion of it is not like um, paper piecing or anything. This, this is a Christmas stocking. So close will count. We're playing horseshoes. So I have registration marks. So that um, where there's three slashes, those edges go together. Where there are two slashes, those edges go together and a slash here for the one. So tape it all together. This is going to be your template for cutting out um, the various shapes of the outer shell and the lining and the batting for your project. Remember I talked about the shift of where the star was on the stocking itself? That's where you will find lines on the template if you want it higher or lower. So make sure that if you want it to be um, the one that is like the cream color, circle that, circle that, and know that those two lines are your uh, marking lines for the lower cream color stocking style. Okay? Now, what you need to do is I've got my fabric for the outer portion of my stocking. I laid it out, <coughs> laid my fabric out and put my template on top. The instructions will tell you to cut it three quarters of an inch larger than the template. <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> that is because you're going to be doing some quilting. And depending on how densely you quilt this project, you may have some draw. So if you were to cut it exact size, it may not fit and line up with your lining later. So I give you that little bit of slush, that extra three quarters of an inch perimeter. It doesn't have to be exact. Close counts. 
We're just putting an extra perimeter um, around it so that you have enough room in, in case you want to densely quilt something. Okay, so cutting out the outer shell of the stocking itself and then transfer, take a fabric marking pen, transfer the cutting line that you want to use to splice apart just the front. So I'm going to take this. This is my back. I'm keeping my back over here. We don't want to cut it. The portion that I want to cut apart to <coughs> insert this. Otherwise, I had to make a template for the bottom and a template for the top and, and one for the back. That seems like way too many pages. So we are going to cut. I transfer those marks to my fabric. You don't need to use a rotary cutter. You can use the scissors if you like. I'm going to cut this um, piece apart. And the centerpiece can either be discarded or you could use this for the spacers I'm going to talk about in a second. But in the meantime, I'm going to put this out of the way so I don't confuse anything. I'm lay, leaving my pieces lay right here. I'm looking for my star. The star is going to go here. And there are instructions for cutting two spacers that are, hmm, what were they? Two and a half by I think six and a half. They are going to go on each side of the star because we need to kind of get it to fit that center portion. So right sides together, out, the pit pre um, press the bar or the rectangle away from the star. Same thing on the other side, stitch a quarter inch seam, press it toward the outer edge, and then center this piece and this piece along the top and bottom of the star. As a simple fold in half, find the center and align it and join it. It's gonna be a little bit wider, but not much. By the time you get your seam allowances taken out of that, so it's going to look more like probably a little bit more like this. We don't have time to sew everything together today, so I'm just going to simulate. Once this is sewn, this is going to be the front portion of your stocking, and you've got a back. Now, for most of us as quilters, we think of the quilt top, the batting, and a backing as our quilt sandwich. I'm gonna break the rules. I'm gonna have you layer just this with a piece of batting that's cut approximately the right same size. And you're gonna layer it on top. You can pin baste it, say baste it, whatever is your favorite basting method, and then you're gonna quilt it. Remember me talking about that? It might shrink up a little bit kind of thing. This is where that's got that extra margin so that in case it shrinks a little bit, same with the backing or the back of your, your um, quilt or your stocking. Just the fabric and batting only to do the quilting. I know it's a little unorthodox, but this isn't something like a quilt that's going to be washed a lot. It's going to be hung up at Christmas time and then taken back down. So the quilting process is there to make it look pretty, but it's not um, structurally something that's going to get moved around a lot. And your, your quilting will stabilize. Um, nicely in there. That way, once you get these both quilted, then take your template back and trace, kind of center this um, shape on top where it needs to be because there's going to be some seam allowances out here also. So this is going to be down a ways. Trace this on both pieces and cut out that exact shape. Now you've got it with just seam allowances and it's just right ready to go. Okay, we've got that quilting, we've got our, our piecing done, we've got our quilting done. Now it's time for the fun assembly part. Now I talked about the fact that um, you could do this as a whole fabric without having any um, piecing in, involved in it. And because I didn't have enough of the same fabrics to keep moving forward there, I chose another set of fabrics. And I think I really kind of would like to make some of these stock, stocks. So 
This one isn't going to be quilted. It's going to have batting in it, but not actually quilted through. So it's going to have that fluff, but it won't have any quilting lines. I've got the facing part of my stocking. It's layered with batting. There's your batting. These are right sides together. Remember we talked about, we've got the other piece quilted, we've got it cut to shape, put them right sides together and lay them on your, your um, cutting mat. Then from your lining fab or your lining fabric, whatever you want to be the interior of your sock. This was cream, but cream and batting is a really bad teaching tool combination because everything's white and you can't see what I'm doing. So in this case, I chose a um, burgundy flannel that could be the in interior of the sock. Right sides together. This is the fuzzier side of the flannel. Right sides together. Both layers of the lining laying on top of that other sandwich. So we've got, I'm going to walk through it. You're going to have batting and a stock, stocking fabric, stocking fabric and batting right sides together. Then the lining pieces right sides together, all in one giant sandwich. Now, if your machine needs a walking foot in order to deal with the bulk and thickness of this, I would advise using a walking foot. If your machine can deal with the layers and not need a walking foot, so be it. Everyone's machine is a little different horsepower, different capability. So you choose what works best for your machine and your situation. Now, what I suggested is a 3 8 inch seam allowance. 3 8 half, close counts. We're in horseshoe land, right? We're not doing fancy piecing today. We are setting this so that I can stitch all the way around um, the entire shape. Let's see if I can get stitched all the way around. You can tell my machine's working hard at getting through all those layers, but it's doing fine. I have pinned those outer edges because I want them to stay on top of each other and not slip apart, which can easily happen if you don't do pinning. I can hear in my head my mom saying, you know, pins are always best. Kind of like an insurance policy that nothing is going to get out of place. You won't get a uh, tuck or a crease or a shift at the last minute but make sure you remove those pins as you approach them. A little slower on the curve, if you haven't done a lot of curves before. I come to quilting from a garment sewing background, so curves kind of seem normal to me. Though I haven't done a lot of garment sewing for quite a few years. All those years of 4-H paid off, I guess. And this is a style of stocking that is very, very quick to get put together if you want to do, like I said, just a solid stocking without any piecing. Because sometimes we do find fabrics that are just so fabulous that, you know, this pink and red and white with the trees really doesn't need piecing with it. It can stand on its own quite well. Do this last side here really quick. There we go. All the way to the end. I'm not doing the top edge. So that's the only portion you leave open. I have my quilt sandwich here. This top edge is open. This is the point where it's best to go in and clip into the seam allowance on any curve so you get a, a smoother curve because that's a lot of fabric, a lot of thickness on curved portions. And as I learned in garment sewing, whenever you have a curve and you clip into it, you release that and so it can form the shape that you want it to. So do that on all of the curved edges. I'm just going to do a few of them here because it's, it takes a little while to do the the clipping. Don't clip into the seam allowance, just the seam, or the seam itself, just the seam allowance. That's where these really great sharp snips are fabulous for doing those kind of, that kind of clipping. And 
Karen K. Buckley, I believe, is the designer of this style of scissors. It's one of my favorites. Uh, a friend warned me, you're going to like them, and she's exactly right. I do love them. Okay, so around all your curves, you're going to do that clipping to release that stress on the seam there so that you can do this. First, you're going to put your hand in between just the lining layers. So just the lining, okay? Put your hand down into that sock and turn your Santa sock. We're doing a double turn. It seems silly, but it works fabulously. I learned this from another quilter and she's right. This is a fun, fun stocking style to put together. So now I have just the lining on the outside part, portion of my sock. And now I'm gonna put my hand inside the um, colorful part where the trees are, hand all the way to the tip, grab a hold of that seam allowance and pull the whole thing right side out. Works every time. Now you can go back and shape that curve. Hopefully where you clipped, I should have clipped more, but we are kind of long on time already. So we'll do the best we can. Aha, we have a Santa sock. We have a top edge though, that's raw edges and needs to be finished off. So in your instructions, it had you make a cuff that was I think six, about six inches wide by almost 16 inches long. Simple piece of fabric. You're going to put, take the two short ends and holding right sides together, a quarter inch seam along one end, press your seam allowance open, and then fold wrong sides together. So you have a cuff magically. You're going to make a loop for hanging your stocking because every stocking needs to hang for Santa to come. There's a rectangle of fabric that it has you um, cut, press it in half lengthwise, and then press the, the um, long edges toward the center fold. And then again, it's like making bias tape basically. And then you'll stitch, top stitch this. Once it's top stitched, you match up the little short cut edges and then follow the instructions so that you go to the interior of the sock, place, this is much easier if you have it stitched and maybe even basted those little pieces together, position it toward the back corner or seam of the top of the sock, place the loop going down into the sock, out of the way, like such. I've got them laying down inside there with a loop going down into the sock. Then take the cuff, place it inside. And if you wanna match up the seam allowance to a side edge, that's always nice to kind of get it out of the way so it doesn't show up on the front of your sock. Kind of maneuver it down inside. This is kind of the fussy part of getting it down inside the sock and matched up. See how it lays right down inside there now? I would pin all along this edge, then stitch along that edge and I'll unveil where my seam is later. See the seam, if you had that tucked inside, the seam is along that top edge and I went back and I zigzagged it. So we got a, a straight stitch line there and a zigzag. So it's all nice and see how that's nice and trimmed off. So it's nice and clean. And then take the cuff from the inside and bring it out and over the seam allowance. It covers it all up, all hidden away. You have clean edges on the inside of your sock. You have the hanger. And on this one, I um, purchased some of the pom-pom trim. It made me think of the 70s so much. I laid it on top of the cuff and stitched it in place with a simple um, small zigzag of matching thread color. So our Santa sock is ready for Santa to fill 
with lots of goodies. Um, I didn't see any questions pop up as we were going through it today. Remember, you can do the piecing if you like. You can make a Santa sock out of one really dynamic, fabulous fabric also. So create a Santa sock that speaks uh, for your personality, your home, and your season. Thanks for joining me today. Remember the Craftsy Code. If you want to get a deal on um, some really fun, maybe Christmas gift ideas over at Craftsy, they've got a code for you. And I'm hoping that he'll drop it into the chat one more time so that you don't have to dig for that discount code at Craftsy. And I will see you in the new year. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year.